Good evening, my name is Alejandra Ramos Riera and I will be your host for tonight. Thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar, The Puerto Rican Experience in the US Military, a Century of Unheralded Service and Celebration of National Borinquen Year's Day. The impact and meaning of the Puerto Rican service in the armed forces of the United States go beyond mere numbers. In this webinar, historian and author, Dr. Harry Franky Rivera, explored the impact of military service for Puerto Rico and the Puerto Ricans. Also with this webinar, we are officially launching the Center for Puerto Rican Studies e-journal initiative, which we will talk more about later on. Before we take off, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Carlos Vargas Ramos, Director of Public Policy, External and Media Relations and Development for the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, who will provide some welcoming remarks. Carlos. Welcome. Thank you very much, Alejandra. Buenas tardes, good afternoon, and welcome to all of you who have joined us this afternoon for this wonderful occasion. Uh, this afternoon's event is not what has become one of our regular webinar presentations, uh, which is the way we have been engaging the public over the past year. Uh, tonight's webinar, as Alejandra pointed out, the Puerto Rican experience in the US military, a century of unheralded service and celebration of the first National Borinquen Year's Day is also the premiere, as Alejandra suggested, of the Centros e-journal, which is Centros uh, Digital Humanities Initiative. Uh, therefore, I not only want to welcome and thank our featured scholars, Dr. Harry Franke and La Laura Lee Oviedo, but also the wonderful digital humanities team that has worked so hard over the many months uh, to bring us not only this terrific exhibit, but also nearly a dozen others, which we will be making available over the course of the year. Uh, the Central E-Journal brings to fruition the desire to provide a new digital humanities resource to scholars to expand Central's digital exhibits uh, of archival, archival collections with the broader public engagement and innovative digital humanities projects. Uh, and this effort could not have taken place without the dedication of the scholars that uh, bring these uh, exhibits together. Uh, but the central staff directly involved in the digital humanities exhibit. Alejandra Ramos Riera, our host for this evening, Sebastian Collado Meltz, uh, Jasmine Cordero, as well as our librarian, Aníbal Arrocho. To all of you, thank you very much for this wonderful product uh, and event. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, we need to remember that we are here marking a terrific event, uh, the first National Boring Canyers Day, a celebration of the service that Puerto Rican soldiers have provided this country, often without recognitions, uh, but always faithfully. Therefore, in honor of their service, we present to you this program this evening. Thank you very much. Enjoy the event. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I will now introduce the speakers and the panelists of this webinar, starting with the author, Dr. Harry Frankie Rivera, is an associate professor of history at Bloomfield College, New Jersey. He is a prolific published author, documentary producer, public intellectual, cultural critic, blogger, political analyst, and NBC Latino Rebels and HuffPost contributor. His work has been featured in national and international media outlets, such as Telemundo, The New York Times, and NPR. His latest book, Soldiers of the Nation, Military Service, and Modern Puerto Rico 2018 has been widely praised. His next book, Fighting on Two Fronts, The Ordeal of the Puerto Rican Soldier During the Korean War, will be published by Centro Press. He served in the U.S. Army Reserve and National Guard for over a decade and currently serves in several academic advocacy and policy boards, such as the National Puerto Rico Agenda. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the commentator of this webinar, Laura Lee Oviedo. Laura Lee Oviedo is a project historian for the Philanthropy Initiative at Smithsonian National Museum of American History where she was also a curatorial fellow for the Division of Armed Forces History and Project Historian for the War and Latinx Philanthropy Initiative. As a PhD candidate 
of History at Texas A&M University. Her research examines how war and militarization impacts Latinx community and shapes their understanding of identity, rights, citizenship, and belonging. We are truly very happy to have you two on board tonight. During the course of this webinar, all of you, all of you, all the attendees will be able to interact directly with the panelists through the Q&A function. To do this, click on the Q&A icon that you will see in the webinar controls at the bottom of the Zoom window. And you just go ahead and type your questions. Questions will be selected as we go on. Now, I will leave you with Laura Oviedo and Harry Frankie Rivera. Good evening and thank you for being here. Please join me as I explain the digital exhibit, A Century of Unheralded Warfare, and we focus on the history of the Borinquenaires and their role in Puerto Rican history. Puerto Ricans have been serving the United States military since 1898 as volunteers and scouts and in Puerto Rican units since 1899. Their service has been either ignored, lionizing heroic accounts, or the soldiers themselves villainized as vende patrias, or condescendingly treated as pawns in a game they didn't understand, or a simple cannon fodder for the wars of the empire. All these approaches are wrong. They fail to understand how complex the history of military service has been in the development of the people we call the Puerto Ricans. This is why we have created this exhibit, tracing the rich and unknown history. A century of, hun of unheralded service is how we have called this exhibit, and we'll explain why. The exhibit goes beyond numbers, places, battles, and war. That can be found in Google. The exhibit thematic digs into how military service has influenced the history of Puerto Rico and the Puerto Ricans. It covers from the last quarter century under Spain all the way to the present. It includes primary documents, records, letters, newspaper clips, videos, images, maps, and interviews with the veterans. It addresses reasons to serve, to join, or to stay, and from the GI Bill to PTSD and the creation of new diasporic centers across the United States led by a military migration. And the content and text accompanying this exhibit has been peer reviewed and curated. There is much context and analysis involved in the production of this exhibit. The target audience goes from Puerto Ricans wanting to know more about their history and ancestry to high school and college students. And it is also a good departing point for college professors and the general audience to initiate their own research in this very rich history. I would like to take the opportunity to focus today on one of the topics covered in this exhibit. The past June 25, 2020, marked the 70th anniversary of the beginning of the Korean War. No conflict has been as impactful and transformative for Puerto Rico and the Puerto Ricans as the Korean War. In a slightly over three years of fighting, some 61,000 Puerto Ricans served in the United States Armed Forces, mostly in the Army, and they suffered over 300 3,500 casualties, of which over 700 were killed in action or died of their wounds. By comparison, during World War II, 65,000 Puerto Ricans served, of which 368 lost their lives in combat, training, and accidents. The number of Puerto Ricans serving in the biggest conflagration ever was about the same of the Korean War, where the fighting was limited to the Korean Peninsula. These numbers Tell us much about the nature of Puerto Rican involvement in both wars. In a regional conflict, although global repercussion like the Korean War, the number of Puerto Rican fatal casualties was twice as much as in World War II. This is the case because the Korean War was the first instance in which large numbers of Puerto Ricans were sent into combat at first line troops and as Puerto Rican units. This is the most relevant issue and part of what makes the Korean War so impactful in Puerto Rican history and society, both for the archipelago and Puerto Rican stateside communities. Moreover, unlike the Vietnam War, 
Most of the Puerto Ricans who served in the Korean War did so as infantrymen and as part of the 65th United States Army Infantry Regiment. The history of this regiment is another element making the Korean War so different from other conflicts in Puerto Rican history. The 65th Infantry was known in Puerto Rico as El 65 and its men as the Borinquenier, a Spanish and English transliteration of Boriquen, the Arawak or Taino indigenous name for Puerto Rico. They fought in Korea from 1950 to 1953 as part of the United States Army 3rd Infantry Division. The 65th was a distinctively Puerto Rican outfit. The enlisted men, non-commissioned officers, and some junior officers in the 65th were Puerto Ricans, while most senior officers were Continental Americans. The origins of this segregated unit are found in the aftermath of the Spanish-American War of 1898 with the creation of what came to be known as the First American Colonial Army. Intended for service on the island, regarded as some fit for combat and overseas deployment, and colloquially called a Roman Coke outfit, the 65th was kept far from combat until the Korean War when it was sent to fight as first-line troops for the first time. It is important to notice that the 65th was not a National Guard unit, but part of the regular United States Army. The fact that the 65th was a segregated regiment for Puerto Rican enlisted men and led mostly by non-Puerto Rican whites made its rank and file colonial troops and the regiment the only Hispanic segregated unit in the United States military. Up to the Korean War, institutional racism had kept Puerto Rican units from the battlefield just like most African American units. They were simply not trusted in battle because of their race and culture as many official documents from the War Department evidence. On October 12, 1950, Puerto Ricans learned that the 65th was fighting in Korea. The island's newspaper were full of stories and pictures of the soldiers and the ceremonies held previous to their departure. Island-wide, the people of Puerto Rico joined to support the 65th throughout the war. Governor Luis Muñoz Marin often made reference to the men of the 65th in his speeches. The crest of the regiment was painted in public buses and train cars. Plazas and avenues were named to honor the regiment. Returning soldiers, especially the wounded, were received as heroes and treated to public reception by government officials. Governor Muñoz Marin himself attended the burials of the fallen and sent his recorded speeches to the troops in Korea. In the early days of the war, a day did not pass in which the island press didn't write about the Puerto Rican soldiers. Soldiers were also paid to endorse local products, from non-alcoholic mild beverages to powder milk. Some of the soldiers' exploits even found their way to comic strips in Puerto Rico. The 65th had become a national icon on the island and among the growing Puerto Rican communities in the mainland. The majority of the men of the 65th Infantry could have not been prouder to belong to a regiment with such strong ties to Puerto Rico. The island civilian population shared that same pride. What were the reasons for such sentiments? Most of the 65th enlisted men had entered the military to escape the island's economic problems. But once they joined the regiment, they remained in uniform for something else besides a steady pay. Even after the Korean War had become a bloody stalemate and the Puerto Rican press began to publish long casualty lists, the recruiting stations in Puerto Rico never lacked for enthusiastic volunteers. The daily news in the local press Detailing the heroic of the Borinquenieres led to many men enlisting, hoping to be assigned to the 65th, the All Puerto Rican Regiment. Many Puerto Ricans did not serve with the 65th, and it could not absorb the steady stream of volunteers from the island. Of the roughly 43,000 men who served with the 65th, over 39,000, or roughly 91%, were volunteers. The numbers of Puerto Ricans volunteering to fight in this war led to recruitment centers in Puerto Rico rarely having to use the draft. The press and Puerto Rican politicians shared much of the responsibility for the people's willingness to go to war. These opinion makers heralded the Borinquenieres as heroes even before they reached Korea. The press, the politicians, elected officials, and the private sector praised, and I quote, our boys 
fighting alongside the United Nations to defend world freedom and democracy, end of quote. And think about that, colonial subject defending world freedom and democracy. In addition, the press talk about the experience of the 65th as a possible catalyst for getting rid of, and I quote, the old man and for forging a modern Puerto Rican nationality, end of quote. These same articles also praise the role of the Borinqueneers in abolishing Puerto Rican's inferiority complex, and I quote, the byproduct of hundreds of years of colonial type regimes, end of quote. The Puerto Rican press, elected officials, and politicians saw in the Korean War an opportunity to prove that Puerto Ricans were politically mature and hence ready for self-determination. By doing so, political leaders and the news media place a heavy burden on the Puerto Rican people who came to see as their duty to either volunteer for military service or support the war effort. The local leadership, especially the Popular Democratic Party under Luis Muñoz Marin and the press, sold to the masses the ideals of heroism, democracy, freedom, and a modern Puerto Rico to secure a more autonomous government for the island, and in many ways it tied their political project to participation in the war. In a very real sense, the battle the Puerto Ricans fought in Korea was a battle for equality, and for many, one of decolonization. At least, that is how many of the men perceive it and how the political elites imagine it. Donning the uniform during the Korean War, in particular that of the United States Army, also had political and social value for emerging communities in the eastern seaboard of the United States. The actions of the 65th were included in the Acts and Annals of Congress and published in the national press. The Puerto Rican state side local community and press also follow the war on the Borinqueneers. They kept an eye on the returning soldiers and in particular on the wounded and repatriated former prisoners of war as they completed a circuit that took them from Korea to Japan to the West Coast, often to Wartel Reed Military Hospital in Maryland, New York, and for most, finally to Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican community and press follow in detail the return of their heroes and New York City official gave the keys of the city to several of them while parades were organized to honor them. This happened at a time in which some elected official sought answer to, and I quote, the Puerto Rican problem. This problem was nothing but the constant influx of Puerto Ricans to the eastern seaboard as Puerto Rico transitioned from an agrarian to an industrial-based economy and relied on the exodus of hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans to the mainland to alleviate unemployment. As Puerto Rican communities grew, they faced all kinds of discriminations. Highlighting the service and sacrifice of Puerto Ricans in the war was a form of politics of respectability and also a way of staking a claim of belonging for sprawling Puerto Rican stateside communities. The 65th status as a national icon and source of price and belonging went beyond the archipelago. The call to arm, the call to arm nevertheless, was ambiguous. The press and the governor of the island told Puerto Rican that it was their duty as Puerto Rican to defend the American nation, to which they belong. That was the message. The enthusiastic response to this call further complicated the essence of Puerto Ricanness. It was common for soldiers deployed in Korea to express they felt they were both Puerto Ricans and Americans. This is one of the central issues I explore in my forthcoming book, Fighting on to Front, the experience of the Puerto Rican soldiers in the Korean War, soon to be published by Centro Press, because the narrative regarding the Puerto Rican's identity became one of the ideological pillars for the creation of the Free Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, or the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Estado Libre Asociado, which was established on July 25th, 1952 and which still defines the relation between the United States and the island. Now we welcome Laura Oviedo to comment on this presentation. Thank you so much, Laura, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Laura, as Alejandra did note. Um, and thank you for Harry's uh, first segment of his webinar presentation. Um, what I'm going to do in the next, in the next, um, is is my in my segment is to kind of provide an overarching history of 
where of how Latino military service has been written about and explored in academia and in public history. I'll make some connections and intriguing points of Harry's uh, webinar. And then I'll close out with how the digital uh, journal exhibit uh, by El Centro provides a groundbreaking, but also very foundational uh, work for future scholars or the public who wants to get to know more about this. Um, and so I'm gonna play a video as I'm talking um, with photos with photos of celebrations that I've gone to in Puerto Rico to celebrate not only the Borinquenieres, but all the veterans. And so that will be playing as I am discussing. Um, in Latino and Latina history, the, La, the, the veterans have been a large part of civil rights history, and most of their participation has been at the forefront of how these com communities have fought for civil rights um, for their communities. Um, I started off as a historian doing research in Chicano communities. Um, I grew up with three brothers in the military and with I can't even count on all my toes and hands how many family members and um, friends I have in the military. And growing up along the US-Mexico border, for me, it always just surprised me how many Mexicans are joining the military despite all the immigration laws or the anti-Mexican sentiment that our communities felt. And so for me, it was always very confusing growing up you know, with military JROTC programs in every high school, making presentations already in elementary. And so, you know, as I started to become, you know, a historian in training and really trying to learn about that, I started to expand kind of my questions to look at all Latino communities and really get at the point of how and why Latino communities have been serving the military when, U.S. history has shown us that we've been treated as second-class citizens. Um, and with scholarship growing in um, Latino military history, the veterans have not only been put at the forefront of civil rights history, but like Harry noted in his presentation, part of the narrative of having these veterans serve the military has kind of been looked through a microscope of of a love of country. And usually that country or well, the country is the US. Um, but when you look at the different Latino communities, we have to really look at the uniqueness and of their history and the relationship to the US. So when I started looking and uh, looking into not just Chicano veterans, but looking at Puerto Rican veterans, for me, it was just very striking and very important to, to know the history the colonial relationship that they have had with the U.S. and how the island and its people have continuously throughout history been serving in the military, trying to fight for rights. And it becomes more than just a love of country. It's more complicated, as Harry noted, and it's more about survival. You know, sometimes veterans serve the military because that's their only option to social mobility, to provide food on the table for their families or to provide or to get an education afterwards. And so part of Harry's presentation and just the books, the book that he, um, that he did publish, Shoulders of the Nation, it gets at this complicated complicatedness, the complexity of Puerto Rican military service. But I think it's very important for our communities and for everybody to, to note. And I think as, we continue to learn more about it. The e-journal provides a superior foundation for that because as someone who's done research all over Mexico City and Puerto Rico and the US, um, I haven't found an archive or a place where I can go and conduct all these, uh, conduct research that specifically looks at Puerto Rico's uh, long-standing relationship with military service. Um, and one of the other questions, if you're looking at the screen with a video, um, is one of the one of the major questions that I have and concerns, but also um, I think it leaves room for growth and 
that the e-journal does is this photo that you're seeing right now is uh, looking at the damas, right? The damas at Puerto Rico during World War II, looking at not only how war and military service impacts um, men, but how it also impacts women, right? You have Puerto Rican women serving during World War II. They have their own units um, and they continue to serve uh, post-World War II and not just women in military service, but you have damas de Puerto Rico, like these um, on the screen, providing psychological, emotional, and physical labor to support family members that are in the military, both men and women. And I think it's very important um, for people to know this, which is why I think that this e-journal is very important for not just academics or people that are researching professionally, but for the public to understand that, you know, when people go off to fight in war, it becomes a community effort. Um, and as Harry shows throughout his webinar, it becomes a community effort of politicians, of news, of the press, of soldiers, and also families. And uh, you see this photo, this is actually the, photo of women in the boarding of the boarding Guineer auxiliary. This was taken two years ago and um, they still support the boarding Guineers association that still survives today. And they go and attend monthly meetings and they provide the support for their families or just friends that have served. And so one, I want to leave to want to leave this first segment letting you know that Puerto Ricans have been serving, I mean, obviously Puerto Ricans have been serving, but also the e-journal, how it provides um, different aspects of Puerto Rican military history that is not, not available elsewhere. And it leaves open questions um, like that photo of the Dama showed of for future researchers to come in and try to, to expand on that and build on that for other people to get to know. Um, and so now I'm gonna open it up to any questions. If anybody has any questions on what I've said of what Harry has uh, presented in his webinar, please go ahead and add questions to the chat. And I will, me and Harry will be more than glad to answer any of them since we don't have a lot of time to discuss everything that we know. <laughs> I think we okay. had a, a, I think we had a few questions. Um, uh, that I've been answering while they watch what we have produced. Um, one of them is the perennial question of, of whether citizenship was extended to uh, the Puerto Ricans so they could be drafted. And that, uh, to this day, that shouldn't even be a question. I mean, uh, when the draft for World War I was passed, it called for um, American nationals to be subjected to the draft. And Puerto Rican were American nationals since 1900 because of the Foraker Act. On top of that, the original uh, draft law excluded Puerto Ricans from military service because of the simple reason that um, Puerto Ricans were not wanted in the military. They were considered to be culturally, cu culturally and racially inferior, right? And it was the Puerto Rican legislature who um, uh, demanded that, that Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans were included as part of the war um, effort. As a matter of fact, there's, um, uh, there's an article um, that is included in this, um, um, in the digital exhibit that it has the documents and the reference showing all this. And if uh, one of the um, hosts could please uh, 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 put it in the message board so um, the audience could uh, access it, that would be great. But that's a question and I don't blame you to believe it. I grew up with, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico with that belief. It was part of my DNA and part of what made me want to be a, a military historian was to, um, was to prove that. And when I saw the records and it was uh, the whole opposite, Puerto Ricans were actually no one in the military in, in mass and in Puerto Rican units. Uh, the 65th was a huge exception, right? And even though they were the elite of the Puerto Ricans and they were highly trained, they only went to Panama. And in World War II, they were not even meant to be in combat because they were not trusted as combat troops, even as well-trained as they were, because 
of what the army, because the, 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 the army and mainstream American consider them to be racially and culturally inferior. Okay, Harry, and I think we have another question from Juan Perez. Um, he asked, how were soldiers assigned to the 65th? Some family members and friends of the family uh, from the World War II Korea era were in other units. So how were they assigned to the to specifically the 65th? Well, um, this is um, um, this is a great um, question uh, because a lot of Puerto Ricans who joined during uh, who volunteered to serve during the Korean War, they hoped that they would be sent to the 65th. But the 65th was um, was at over capacity. So a lot of the people who volunteered in Puerto Rico and training toward together in Puerto Rico, they received all of their military training. They received it in Puerto Rico. They were inducted and they trained in Puerto Rico, hoping that they would be assigned to the 65th. But in the 65th, the 65th, which was at over capacity, right, could not receive them. They would be sent to other units. So they were assigned to Puerto Rico um, when the 65th uh, needed them. And by the second part of the war, even some Puerto Ricans from New York, um, other parts of, of the mainland United States started to be assigned to the 65th, especially because as Puerto Rican veterans were uh, rotated, uh, a lot of Puerto Ricans coming from Puerto Rico were not fu fully bilingual like the previous soldiers. So they started to uh, send Puerto Ricans from New York and other parts of the United States to the 65th to fill that language gap. So that's what will get you in the second part of the war, you were in New York, what would get you in the 65th was that you spoke English and Spanish and you could um, you could fill the language gap. Okay. <clears throat> the other question that we have from Rosalind Cleary is at this time, do we also see the transition of Puerto Rican women into the workplace such as in factories that is evident in the US? Yes, we do. We, we do, right? And perhaps we do it even in higher numbers because as you mentioned, the wax in World War II, right? There were only about 247, right? And in World War I, the, the Puerto Rican women who serve in the military is even lower. It's not as open and as wide as, it's, as it was in the continental US, right? For men, uh, there were more open spaces in the military, but when the men are out, right? Then those spaces, someone had to fill. Uh, someone had to fill those um, those spaces, and on top of that, this is a, a period of time in which Puerto Rican males are being asked to migrate seasonally to the United States to work. So in Puerto Rico, you're going to see a lot of uh, you're going to see great percentages of women joining um, the labor force and actually being the backbone of the labor force. Okay, and we have another question from Mary Lou Clemente is serving in the military for quote, financial stability and better opportunities and quote, still that way in Puerto Rico? Uh, well, yes. And I would say that is, um, it is similar to some of the poorer states in um, some, some of the uh, poorer federal states, but in Puerto Rico, there's also, uh, it's much, it's much, uh, it's different i.e. serve in the military in, the, in Puerto Rico, in the Army Reserve and in the National Guard of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And one of the things that I noticed in Puerto Rico is that like in the other places, most of the people who serve in the military, they come from the working class, but they also use that service to get an education and go from working class to middle class. As a matter of fact, about 7% of Puerto Rican veterans have completed PhDs, which is about twice or almost twice the percentage of, of Puerto Rican civilian. And this is because in Puerto Rico, because of the economic situation and the relationship with the United States, right? And the economic, and the economic realities for too many people, for a great percentage of the population, the military is their only uh, hope to get an education and a better chance in life. And this continues to be the case uh, to this day. Okay. <clears throat> we have a few questions about we have a few questions about the the scholarship on uh, Puerto Rican military history um, and access to that and I think that's a really great way to jump into the e-journal conversation because I think part of the problem 
in doing research in Latino communities is trying to find archival documents because, I mean, if you think about it, you know, historians that have done, you know, um, white American history for so long, they've left written diaries and like all this stuff. And you kind of see that less in Native American communities or, I mean, there's different ways of of leaving histories behind in different communities. But one of the one of the difficulties that you know researchers have with these type of topics is the access to to archival documents, but also even funding. You know, not all people have the money or the funding to go to Puerto Rico and go do archival research at the University of Puerto Rico or um, you know at, at in other centers that they have there for research. So as far as looking at what kind of research have you done to put together this e-journal for the exhibit that can help out um, others? Well, this has been um, uh, the research for what you see here. I started when I started my, uh, uh, my master degrees at Temple University back in 1999. And it has continued to this day. And uh, when I was still part of Centro, um, Many years after that, when I was still uh, uh, part of Centro, uh, I saw that uh, Centro was moving toward creating digital exhibits, and I knew that I had digitized a lot of this information. And and in it, I was also kind of worried about um, the lot of misinformation out there, or the information that is there without a context. So I, uh, so we came up with the idea of creating a digital exhibit, and it was basically. Uh, digitizing uh, the research done in the Munoz Marine Archives, uh, the, the things that I recovered from the Museum of the National Guard in Puerto Rico, uh, the pictures um, um, uh, that veterans gave me that they just, uh, many times I had to say, no, I cannot take the original, I'll gladly make a copy. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you're gonna see here come from the veterans that I interview Actually, interviews uh, is now a huge part of, of this. We want the veterans to build the story, right? So, mm -hmm. of course, we have the National Archives, right? That's a great point of departure. But there's also the veteran themselves. They have their own mini archives, and they're uh, so willing to show you their, uh, their tell you their, sto their stories and uh, probably show you, oh, here they're talking about me and give you a a news clip, right? So I digitized those things because that's history coming alive and the person who was there telling you uh, their history, right? Which is part of something bigger. As a matter of fact, they're, they're, these veterans and, and otherwise and their family is what make the history big, right? So uh, the archives in Puerto Rico, the National Archives will contact veterans and interview them. They have kept things that if you treat them if you treat them with respect, they're gonna share them with you. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, sorry, we didn't get to your questions. We'll get to them uh, through the Q&A box, um, but we're gonna jump over to Harry's second segment of his presentation, and then we will continue answering questions uh, following that. The Borinqueneers knew they were in the spotlight and came to internalize their iconic status. On Christmas Eve of 1950, the men of the 65th, the last United Nations troops in Hunan, were finally evacuated from the besieged port after covering the last stage of the 1st Marine Division retreat from the famous Chosin Reservoir. Last year, an American graduate student in the Netherlands sent me an email in which she shared that her grandfather was one of those Marines who, when they reached American lines and safety, were met by men from Puerto Rico. She wrote that she is forever grateful. And so was his grandfather. And so was her grandfather. As the 65th commanding officer, Colonel William W. Harris, boarded the last transport out of Hunan, someone handed him a copy of an article from the Pacific Stars and Stripes. The article quoted Corporal Ruiz of Puerto Rico, saying, "And I quote: We're proud to be part of the United Nations forces, and we are proud of our country. We feel that too many people do not know anything about Puerto Rico." They think that we're all natives who climb trees. We're glad for the chance to fight the communists and also for the chance to put Puerto Rico on the map. It will be a great accomplishment if we can raise the prestige of our country in the eyes of the world. 
Puerto Rican soldiers were praised as heroes and champions of democracy abroad and at home. Things would change during the second half of the war and the record of the engineers would be temporarily stained. The replacement of combat hardened truth with poorly trained yet enthusiastic recruits who spoke little English, an acute dirt of bilingual NCOs, a new continental officer that did not speak Spanish, some who openly showed disdain for Puerto Rican soldiers and officers, led to tragic events during the Battle of Outpost Kelly and Jackson High in the autumn of 1952. The back-to-back -back debacles were followed by a series of mass corps marshals in which 87 enlisted men and one Puerto Rican officer received sentences ranging from six months to 10 years imprisonment, total forfeiture of wages, and dishonorable discharges for charges going from willful disobedience of a, su of a superior officer to cowardice before the enemy. Such news were hard to swallow for the Puerto Rican public. An assembly of soldier parents, mostly mother, drafted and sent a rather spartan message to President Dwight Eisenhower. The message read, preferimos ver los muertos. The parents' resolution published in the January 26, 1953 edition of the daily El Imparcial in Puerto Rico stated, and I quote, we prefer to receive the corpses of our son killed heroically on the battlefield of Korea than to have them return stained with the stigma of cowardice, end of quote. The parents asked for their son to have the chance to prove their accusers wrong by returning to the battlefield. Many of the sentenced soldiers wrote similar letters which were then published in the local press in a Rare display of national unity, Puerto Rican from all walks of life and different political affiliations and ideologies found common ground and rallied in defense of the Borinqueneers. They were joined by continental officers who had served with the regiment. General J. Lawton Collin, who had visited the training camps in Puerto Rico and was very familiar with the 65th, told the House Armed Service Committee, and I quote, the Puerto Ricans have proved that they're brave and can fight as well as any other soldier when properly trained and equipped, end of quote. Under pressure, the military agreed to conduct a review of the sentences. Few of the soldiers of the 65th had their sentences re reduced. The review board found the verdicts and sentences to be correct in law and fact. Between June and July of 1953, however, the Secretary of the Army reviewed the cases and remitted the unexecuted portion of the sentences of all but four of the accused. The soldiers who had their sentences remitted were returned to duty. The Puerto Rican public was still roiling from the effect of mass trial when more bad news reached the island. On March 4, 1953, an army spokesperson announced that the 65th would be integrated with Continental troops and the excess Puerto Rican soldiers would be sent to other units. The 65th would cease to exist as a Puerto Rican unit. The vast majority of Puerto Rican soldiers serving with the 65th Infantry promptly condemned the Army's decision. Pedro Martir, a member of the 65th for 17 years, declared that he would rather lose his pension than continue to serve in an integrated 65th. Other soldiers objected to the integration on the basis of unit pride and the fear of being ridiculed by Continental troops because of cultural differences and their difficulty with the English language. Corporal Felix Rodriguez insisted, and I quote, I think it's better to fight with my own people. We understand each other. Private First Class Antonio Martinez, a engineer from New York, commented that racial prejudice could make life hard for Puerto Rican service, for Puerto Rican serving in other regiments. The regiment, however, was quickly integrated as planned. Eventually, the Borinqueneers record would be restored. In 1954, the 65th Infantry returned to Puerto Rico and was reconstituted as an old Puerto Rican formation. The island had its regiment back, but not for long. The 65th was deactivated in 1956, but the unit story did not end there. Colonel Cesar Cordero, who had led the 65th during the battle for Output Kelly, and who had advanced to Brigadier General and was serving as Adjutant General of Puerto Rico's National Guard, led an active campaign that culminated with the reactivation and transfer of the 65th from the regular army to the Puerto Rico National Guard in 1959. And this is the first time and the only time this has happened in the history of the United States military.
when a federal unit is transformed into a state unit. Unlike its participation during the war, this event received scant publicity, and soon the 65 and Devorin Kinniers, and their epic ordeal during the Korean War, faded into a distant and distorted memory. The Puerto Rican had rescued their beloved regiment, but its history had not been restored. The Borin Kinniers record remained stained. The culmination of the recovery and restoration process is the awarding of the Congressional Gold Medal. Obtaining the award comes from the efforts of many groups and organizations, and in particular, the Borin Kinniers Congressional Gold Medal Alliance, an effort that was led from the diaspora. This medal has been awarded to other famous minority um, units, including the Tuskegee Airmen, the Navajo Code Talkers, the Nisei Soldiers, and the Montfort Point Marines, and recently to the World War II Filipino Scouts. The Borinqueneers are the first unit from the Korean War to receive the medal. The ethnicity and race of former recipients is not coincident. All of them fought during times of crisis to defend a country that at the time treated them, at best, like second-class citizens. The medal recognizes the valor and sacrifices of units like the African-American Marines and aviators whose bravery in combat at a time when lynching was common and racial segregation the norm disproved the myth of racial inferiority and unfitness for military service. It also recognizes the courage of Navajo cult talkers who at a time when their language was prohibited in school used it for communications in the battlefield saving countless American lives or it recognizes the pride of Japanese American soldiers who volunteered to join the army and requested combat duty while their families were kept in internment camps. The Borinqueneers made a similar contribution. The men of the 65th were willing to pay the ultimate price at a time when Puerto Ricans were openly labeled in the press, in academic circles, and by elected officials as a problem to be dealt with. The bill awarding the Congressional Gold Medal passed both houses of Congress unanimously. When President Barack Obama signed the bill on June 10, 2014, it recognized the honorable service of the 65th, which during the Korean War had to fight on two fronts. On both fronts, the Borinqueneers, uh, the men of the 65th, conducted themselves with honor and dignity. Since the American Revolution, Congress has commissioned gold medal at its highest expression of national appreciation for distinguished achievements and contribution. Since George Washington received the first one in 1776, only 158 individuals and entities have been awarded the medal to date. Few combat units have earned this accolade. The 65th is the first unit to receive it for its service during the Korean War and they join Roberto Clemente as the only Puerto Rican or Latinos recipient thus far. On April 13, 2021, we observe for the first time National Bodin Caneers Day. For some, this may look like too little and too late, for most Bodin Caneers have passed. Other critics will say it is too much. They did their duty. Move on. The generation of Puerto Ricans who participated in this conflict, dubbed the Forgotten War, is quickly shrinking. Let us make sure that their sacrifices and their ordeal and what they accomplished for Puerto Rico as they fought both the enemy and racism is never forgotten. Let us not forget the meaning of the monuments, roads, and plazas erected and named after them, or why Puerto Rico has so many barrios and sectors named Barrio or Sector Corea. And let us remember that they represent the hopes of a people willing to sacrifice their youth for a better future to pay a tribute of blood in search of acceptance, respectability, equality, a path towards decolonization, and a democracy that has proven elusive to them. I hope you enjoyed the exhibit. Thank you. In this next segment, um, which will be our last segment, at least for myself, um, I'm going to play a video. Um, and I do want to warn you, it does have a video of Roseo, um, but this is part of my personal research. Um, I've been going to Puerto Rico the last five years to be do, to do research on Latinas and Latinos during World or Puerto Ricans during World War II and the Borinquen years. And so part of 
this entire video is going to be part of that personal research. You'll see photos of the Borinquenirs themselves and clips of Veterans Day celebration and Borinquenir specific celebrations um, in the island and the National Cemetery of Puerto Rico. Um, and just to reiterate, um, the Congressional Gold Medal that was awarded on June 10th of 2014, um, it has been a really obviously much needed uh, recognition um, for, for Puerto Rican veterans specifically and their work or their, their service um, and during the Korean War. And as Harry mentioned, they internalized their status as national icons and that continues till today. This video that you're seeing, it's a little bit lengthy, but this was a Veterans Day celebration where the Borinquenirs were actually sat in the first two rows of the entire ceremony. And so it kind of shows their place still today as national icons. And in this specific video, Rosello is repeating and um, articulating what politicians and the press were articulating during the Korean War as, as uh, Harry has mentioned. And he says, and please, he's like, if there is no, isn't a platform of equality, how come there is not that equal treatment for the veterans from Puerto Rico than those of the United States. And then he continues to plead. He says, quote, to my friends in Congress, it is time to put up or shut up. Finalmente, la visión de Puerto Rico solamente es posible con el componente de, la, de los veteranos. Sabemos que los veteranos tienen destreza extraordinaria de disciplina y organización. And he continues on to say how Puerto Rican veterans are central and the ultimate ambassadors to what Puerto Rico has been trying to showcase is recognition, um, acceptability, respectability, and that and self-determination. And he goes on to finish off saying that Puerto Rican veterans are indispensable to the vision Puerto Rico has for its future. And so if you can see these clips, um, these are part of the Veterans Day celebration in Catania um, of 2018. And I think this is important because, you know, um, obviously it's still very important to Puerto Rican history, but now this is also becoming important to really major public institutions in the United States, like the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, um, you know, who's, who's starting to, or not starting, they have been fighting and pushing for initiatives um, to cover the Latino, um, to recover Latino histories and to showcase that Latino history, Puerto Rican history is American history, belongs to the National Museum. Organizations like the National, Pub, uh, National Council on Public, for Public Historians and so many different initiatives, if you really pay attention or not pay attention, but like look into it, there's a large push to include these type of histories and the Borinquenirs are at the forefront, not just for the island, but um, in public history institutions. And, I think for the e-journal, you know, I think it's part of that. It's kind of not answering, but it represents what, you know, Puerto Rican veterans, but politicians, the press and the community on if Puerto Rico has been trying to do is to show like we've contrib contributed to not just the, to, to our island or to the United States, but we have contributed to um, to the, to the, to the world, you know, and the maps and the timelines that are provided in these er journals are exactly what the public needs to see. And they have a visual representation, which I love. If you use the timeline or the maps, it kind of takes you all over and it shows you, you know, Puerto Ricans have been leaving a global footprint throughout their military service. And that is showcased um, in this e-journal. And I think that this is a big effort, um, not just for Puerto, Rico, for Puerto Rico, especially, but also for just the entire world that now has access to this digital archive that is provided to see these, the, the cont contributions that Puerto Ricans have, have done. Um, and I just wanted to share, if you see these videos of the Berenguineers um, at the National Cemetery 
Um, this was actually a very beautiful ceremony where Korean veterans flew in to celebrate uh, the to celebrate the ceremony with the Boring Buenier side by side, and it was just a beautiful beautiful ceremony to to see them and thanking them. And um, part of this initiative has been going on for a few years where Korea has been flying in the Boring Buenier's to share their culture as a way to be thankful for what their part has been in the Korean War and how it's changed their lives. And I can see no other beautiful representation of you know, the Korean veterans and the Puerto Rican veterans coming together to, to celebrate what Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans have done for their own nation. Dile hola. And this, hola. Hola a todos. Hola. El domingo. <laughs> and his aquí en Puerto Rico. <laughs> the lovely, um, Buenos días. Aquí Puerto Rico. <laughs> getting Buenier saying hi and bye to everybody. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. And we will go ahead and jump into questions um, if anybody else has some that we can go ahead and answer. Okay, uh, so we have a question for from Jeff Burroughs to Harry. Can you please one, explain the creation of the category of quote, white Puerto Rican? Good question. And two, discuss the military service of Albizu Campos and its effect on the Nationalist Party movement. All right, um, definitely. Um, those are two great questions, but uh, before we do that, I really wa wa want to uh, thank you, Laura, for how you prepare for this event um, and the research that you have uh, conducted uh, yourself and your investment in these projects, because uh, you are the new generation of emerging scholars and the way you deal with all this issue, it, it really, it really makes my day. And thanks a lot for being here and doing what you're doing for this project. Thank you. So uh, for uh, Jeff's question, yes. Um, as we know, when uh, the United States took over Puerto Rico, they had a segregated military and a segregated society, right? The military is just but like a, a microcosm, a reflection of civil society, right? Uh, there's a lot of room for experimentation. It's been called a, uh, a social laboratory, right? But it's a reflection of, ci of civilian society, right? So when the 65th started in Puerto Rico, it was reserved for white Puerto Ricans, right? And in World War I, it was white Puerto Ricans. And most of the Puerto Ricans served in World War II, particularly when it seems that the 65th was going to go overseas, right? Uh, there's this... Um, story uh, among marine engineers I haven't been able to corroborate it but so many of them have told me the same thing that they were asked take your chairs your chairs off why did they have to take your chairs off because Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico they all I mean even if they're light skin they get the tan and and they start to look the same they wanted to see which one were the real white Puerto Ricans in the 65th because the 65th could have gone to the French Dutch or English Caribbean, right, to free those through from garrison and uh, the Caribbean so they could do the, the fighting. But the governments of these places, they say, we don't want black troops. The response from the Department of the Army was, well, the Puerto Ricans that we're going to send, they're not black, they're white and they speak English and they're educated. That's, you have no idea the requirement that they put on Puerto Rican to serve in the military. First of all, they had to be or look white right, before it was open up for the masses. Second, they had to have twice as much education as the regular private or entity in the mainland, right? And, and they had to be basically, actually that is, that is what explains why so many Puerto Rican who are serving at private are professionals. Professional, serving at private work as in the US, just for being professional, they will be given a commission as officers to lead the troops. In Puerto Rican, you have professionals serving as private. And as a matter of fact, that continues to happen to this day. If you see a Puerto Rican, the National Reserve or National Guard, who spent 12 years as an E4, like the last rank, the last pay grade before being a sergeant, it because most of the National Guard and Army Reserve in Puerto Rico is composed of professional as opposed to most of the um, uh, to most of the active um, units, Army uh, Reserve units, 
and National Guard units in the United States, right? So yes, for World War I in Puerto Rico, uh, there's uh, after the Puerto Rican fight, so they can be part of this military effort, the war to end all wars and whatnot. Um, the military decided to create the Puerto Rican division. The 65th is sent to Panama in World War I, right? Uh, that's as far as they go in World War I. The Puerto Rican division, the 94th division, right? Number after the 92nd and 93rd color division from the United States, right? And there's no coincidence there in the, in the numbering. They were added following the pressure of African-American leaders and Puerto Rican leaders in Puerto Rico, right? So that Puerto Rican division was meant to have three white regiments and one black regiment, right? But Puerto Rican quickly ran out of white passing Puerto Ricans. So they decided to make it two black regiments and two white regiments. Um, Pedro Albizu Campos ended up serving in the 375th, um, actually, sorry, in the 375th regiment of the 94th division, right? It was supposed to be uh, the 373, the three, um, uh, the 372, 373, 370, sorry, 74, 70, forget my numbers, I'm sorry. But uh, the 375th and the 376 were to be like the two regiments of the Puerto Rican division in World War I, and Albizu Campos served with the 375th, right? He was sent to a Puerto Rican color regiment, part of the Puerto Rican division, the Puerto Rican contingent to what it was known as the National Army, right? Uh, some people have argued that this, um, that this experience, that being told by the military that for all means and purposes he was black changed his attitude toward the United States. That it kind of, um, uh, some people never understood why um, created such animosity toward the United States. They say, oh, they mistreated him in the army. He wasn't mistreated in the sense of training. He was mistreated in the sense that instead of being assigned to a white unit, he was assigned to a segregated unit. So, uh, and just like all the Puerto Ricans from that unit, the 94th Division, the war ended before the last regiment was ready for combat and deployment. So they never so, um, uh, so fighting. But on March 2, 1999, the whole division came out on March 2 is when Puerto Rican became citizen, uh, about 10 to 12,000 trainees and trainers of the Puerto Rican division, they marched from their training uh, grounds. It wasn't third together, that is World War II. It was, um, get a help me on this, Laura. It's um, de las casas, they train camp de las casas, the savior or champion of the indigenous people. That's how the training camp in World War I was named, right? So they marched displaying the color of the United Nations. And after that, we know um, um, the career that uh, the path that Pedro Albizu Campos followed. And yes, he was heavily influenced by his experience in the military. He actually, uh, volunteer a couple times while being in the United States. And he was uh, told to, if you want to serve, just go to Puerto Rico and we'll see what we can do. Okay. We have a question from Chicano historian whose work I've actually read, uh, Steven Rosales. He has a question for you. What are some of the most prominent, more prominent comparisons and contrasts that can be made with other Latino and Latino groups, in particular, the Chicano and Chicana community? Huh. Um, well, that's an interesting story. And um, uh, the only thing that prepares me to answer this question is that uh, when you do Puerto Rican stu studies, right? Apparently it's not enough. So whenever you submit something about Puerto Rican, they, they ask you to contrast, con contrast it with um, uh, African-American, the Cuban experience, Chicanos, indigenous, and I'm pretty sure that soon they're going to add Martian, com compare it to Martian. So what I seen is that, um, there's a famous book about World War I, uh, To the Line of Fire, um, uh, written by a uh, uh, Mexican-American historian. And um, his conclusion is that 
actually his argument is really well developed, is that uh, the Mexican American community and the recent uh, Mexican community that has migrated due to the uh, Mexican uh, Revolutionary War, right? They're tired of war. They don't want to be part of the war, but they also want to be accepted. So they just it happened in Puerto Rico and among uh, the African American um, uh, leaders, right? They encourage um, uh, uh, their own to participate in the war to gain acceptance, right? Uh, like politics or respectability. But in the case of um, the Hanos and Californias, a lot of them, they just say, I'm coming from a war, I'm not going to another. So they just uh, pack and go back. Uh, many pack and go back to Mexico only in World War I. That doesn't happen in World War II. And it really doesn't happen in, in Vietnam, right? Puerto Rico, at the moment, um, World War I, right? Um, it's an island. You cannot go anywhere. Plus, uh, there's unemployment, hunger, whatnot. And this war is really being sold as a war to end all wars. And this is something that I always tell uh, researchers. Take the goggles of the Vietnam War off and see World War I for what it was, right? During World War I, there wasn't, there, there, there wasn't anything more manly, uh, manly and heroic than to serve, not just to serve in the military, but to die in war, right? To the point that all across Europe, when World War I started, right? Uh, classrooms full of people, the students got up, left their books and went to join the war, right? This is at this moment in, in, in uh, at least in World War I, right? Fighting in the military and even dying in a war, even if it's not your country, even you're fighting for another country, is a universal male ritual of passage, right? And this is something that you also find in the Mexican American and, and Chicano literature. And it's also found, and really shockingly, in the African American literature about the war participation where they were excluded and sent to a uh, labor unit if admitted, right? So this is the contrast uh, and comparison I made between African American indigenous participation, Chicanos and Puerto Ricans. I, I will add, um, you know, past World War II, I think part of that comparison is also, or contrast, um, is language, I would say, um, at least for the units that I study in World War II. Um, one of the re main reasons why Puerto Ricans, well, there's two main points that I would make. One is language. And although a lot of the uh, veterans, Mexican-American veterans that served during World War II were first generation, because they were born after the Mexican Revolution and therefore they had parents that still spoke only Spanish and then they were, you know, what we call the frontera uh, Spanglish. Um, you know, the, one of the main reasons why Puerto Ricans were segregated was because of language, like Harry mentioned with the Borinquineers, but also race. Uh, during World War II, you see them in, in segregated units, but even some of them being put into African American units. Um, into African-American units and because of the racial malleability of different Latino groups, groupings, depending on the racial makeup, I think you kind of see more of the Puerto Ricans being segregated and even being put into African-American units, whereas Mexican-Americans were in integrated units, um, were also in integrated units. And one of the things uh, Silvia Curbelo covers is in Maggie Rivera's book on, on Latinos in World War II is she looks at the color line during World War II and looking at how officials didn't want to, during World War II, they didn't even want to move Puerto Rican units. They were trying to figure out how do we keep Puerto Rican units on the island because we already have what they used to call the quote, the, the Negro problem. And they didn't want any more black people coming to the main side United States. So that was part, one of the main, one of the reasons why they started to build up and train them on the island to build up the military installations on the island was to keep 
Puerto Ricans from entering the United States because they considered them inferior because of the racial status. And of course, with Mexican Americans are mostly, you know, at the time in the, in the US Southwest, you see some in the Midwest as more literature is coming out, all this stuff. But I think that would be two points of comparison that I think as far as experiences that goes into the military experiences of Chicanos and, and Puerto Ricans. Okay, and uh, we will conclude with that. And now, uh, thank you, Harry, so much for your presentation. And uh, thank you again for inviting me to be part of this. I have admired your work and, you know, you as a person, I think the first time we met was in Puerto Rico uh, through our good friend Aura. Yes. So it was, it, it's very nice to, to keep in touch and to keep, uh, you know, building on this work and um, building on, on your work and even Steven Rosales, who, who's in the audience. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us. And uh, thank you, El Centro. I think what you're doing is amazing and it's gonna make such a big difference. Um, I hope everybody turns to this e-journal and gets as much information as they can. You know, tell your, your brothers, your sisters, your community, everybody, um, you know, just to check it out. You know, people are getting online to get through Facebook or Instagram, you know, take 10 minutes to go through the e-journal, <laughs> get a little bit of Puerto Rican history. So thank you so much and thank you for having us. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Harry. Um, please don't go away. We will have you two on uh, in a few. Um, as Laura noted, and as I, men I mentioned before, um, this project, it is part of Centro's e-journal initiative. Um, Centro's e-journal seeks to offer new experiences taking shape at digital humanities projects in hopes of analyzing, preserving, and reintroducing Puerto Rican history and culture. Um, through this new framework, we seek to expand on Centro's digital exhibits by ways of activating the archival collections within the contemporary presentations. Part of the e-journal vision is to engage with a broader public encompassed by scholars, students, amateur researchers, members of the directly surrounded community of Puerto Ricans and the diaspora. Considering the mission and scope that a digital humanities project entails, our mission is to create a hands-on digital space that offers various entry points into understanding and experiencing the concepts and idea of authors. Um, to, for, in order for you to get a better understanding of this initiative, we will present to you the following video tutorial of the e-journal. Welcome to Centra's e-journal navigation and structure tutorial. The following presentation will show you how to navigate the e-journal site on our webpage and get a closer look at this digital humanities initiative. This is the homepage for Centro. From here, you can access numerous resources, including the e-journal projects. To find the main page for Centro's e-journal, simply hover over the Publications tab located on the horizontal gray bar towards the top of the page. You will see a panel with various options, including the Centro e-journal tab. Click to continue. After clicking on the Centro e-journal tab, this is the page you will find. Here you will find the projects currently on view along with their hero image and a short description. Click on one of the Explore the Projects buttons to access a project. For the following examples, we will be using Aldo Lauria's project on Puerto Rican labor. This is the homepage for said project. From here, you may access a number of tabs, those lined up horizontally towards the top, gallery, bibliography, or history timeline, maps, offer a focused look on some of the components that make up the project as a whole. Those tabs lined up vertically towards the right under the title Puerto Rican Labor are links that directly correspond with the chapters of the project's principal narrative. When you click on the gallery tab, this is the page we are presented. For this project, the gallery is configured as such. The links presented above each image correspond to a chapter within the general narrative. Clicking on these links will take you to the corresponding chapter, just as the links lined up vertically to the right of the page. However, when you click on the image itself, you can see in gallery form all of the images being used. Click on one of the images to see. 
Having clicked on one of the images presented, you are now offered a gallery view of the images entailed with each project. Within this panel, you can navigate back and forth through the images used in that chapter. When you click on the bibliography link, you are directed to this page, which is a straightforward presentation. When you click on the timeline tab, it leads us to this page. Timeline provides an interactive model in which the author highlights specific events mentioned within the general narrative. Using the hours on the panel, you can navigate through these points in time, while still seeing the events listed towards the bottom of the panel in chronological order. Now, let's see the Oral History tab. For the Oral History tab, we'll be using Harry Frankie's project on Puerto Ricans in the military. When you click on the Oral History tab, you are presented with links to past recordings made at Centro. Here you can listen to first-hand accounts from people involved with the subject of this project. Let's now click on the Maps tab. The Maps tab creates an interactive platform where you can see key events in relation to the geographical location of this. With regards to its presentation sequence, the events can be placed in chronological order within the Maps framework. Here we go back to Aldo Laurea's project on Puerto Rican labor. On this page, you see the introduction to general narrative. With the general narrative, the structure includes the main text to the project. To see an example, let's click on the Middle Class Empire tab aligned vertically to the right of the page. As you read the text for each part, you can continue to access the next chapter by using the tabs aligned vertically to the right of the page. You can also use the smart link located at the bottom of each chapter. Here we have the homepage for Harry Frankie's project. Again, we can see the various tabs available on the horizontal line towards the top left of the page, as well as vertically to the right of the page. Let's go ahead and click on the introduction tab to the right of the page. Here we have the first chapter of Harry Frankie's main narrative. You'll notice on the right side of the page, box tabs for multimedia related content and resources by author. These tabs offer additional content for different purposes, such as linking relevant text from within Centro, providing sources to authors, books, and their publications, and connect videos from outside sources. For Harry Frankie's project, he used a timeline of events separate from the Timeline tab function to organize his content as a way of presenting all the chapters with a short description within his intro page in addition to the vertical list of chapters already available to the right of the page. Here's another example of the general narrative view using Harry Frankie's project. Notice the various tabs made available to the right of the page as well as links towards the bottom of the main text. Let's see an example of Noralis Ruiz Project homepage. Let's click on Ana Vélez Mitchell tab at the homepage. Here you see an example of Noralis Ruiz narrative page. Now let's go back and see another example of a project homepage. Here's an example of Ismael Garcia's project homepage. Let's click on the Background to Farm Labor Migration tab. Here's an example of Ismael Garcia's narrative page. Notice that with a more image-oriented narrative, the text goes together almost as captions. As you can see, the e not exhibits offer multiple and dynamic ways to display a digital humanity project and offers various possibilities for the authors to lay out their work. For more information about Centro's e-journal initiative, please write to ejournal at hunter.cuny.edu. That's ejournal at hunter.cuny.edu. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you again to everyone who joined us today. For any final comments and questions regarding the e-journal initiative and the, today's webinar on Harry's Frankie's project, please feel free to ask questions. I will have Laura and Harry join me so, um, so we can take any questions um, that can come, <laughs> come up from the audience. Thank you, Laura, again, for your participation in this webinar. And thank you, Harry. We are very happy to have your project online. And also to the audience, um, we invite you to go through our website and discover everything that we have, our collections, our archives, and feel free to write to us directly. Um, again, the email for any 
e-journal inquiries is e-journal at hunter.cuny.edu, e-journal at hunter.cuny.edu. Um, as we take any final questions, Harry and Laura, do you have anything you um, you would like to add and on your part? Uh, yes, I, I would actually li like to say that this is just the beginning of the project, even though we uh, try to be as, as, as inclusive, inclusive as, as possible, right? We know that Puerto Ricans continue to search to this day, but that even looking back, there's many areas we have to look uh, into. So uh, the whole purpose of the exhibit is for people to explore it and to feel uh, inspired to continue the research because this is what history is. This is what the center, uh, what the mission of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies is, which is to recover our history, right? Um, make it available to all of us. Thank you, Harry. Um, and in case someone is um, curious, the tutorial that you just saw will be available in our webpage soon. So you can use it as a guidance to um, discover this one and upcoming projects that we will continue to have. And we had a question about why we have various names Korea with C in Puerto Rico, right? And we know that Korea in Spanish is written with a C, not a K, right? And there are all kinds of monuments. And in Puerto Rico, we had the 65th, La 65 de Infanteria Avenue that is really famous. And most people, they transit through it without knowing what is named that, right? We don't, we're not alive. Of, uh, we're not aware of all these uh, signs and symbols of our history, which are basically hidden in plain view, right? So these are the big ones and there are other monuments, right? Um, but the name of the barrios happened because in many instances, uh, Puerto Ricans came from all towns of Puerto Rico to find Korea, right? Uh, and it became actually the first total war for the Puerto Ricans. In many instances, people from the same barrio, they would leave one day to join. Brothers, cousins, and friends, a whole group to join. And they would serve together in the 65th or in Korea, they were lucky enough of, uh, that if they were not sent to the 65th, that at least they were sent to the same uh, other unit, right? That's why we have so many uh, barrios and Sector Korea in Puerto Rico. It is, it is a homage, it is a tribute to the people who came from those uh, barrios. And it's actually a, remember, a remembrance of, of the tribute of blood, the lives that were Laws when Puerto Ricans um, fought in a war and in which many of them say that they were fighting to save democracy for the world. We have a few minutes for any last questions, any last comments. Again, visit Harry's um, e journal exhibit, explore it. There's a lot of information there. And thank you again for joining us. Um, Thank you all the staff from Centro for this hard work. Again, Laura and Harry, um, it's amazing that we're here today and we're um, joined at least virtually. And we certainly hope to see you all soon. This is just one of a lot of webinars that we hold at, at Centro. And so please um, keep in touch and have a great evening. Thank you all, thanks for joining. Thank you.